I I saw Cinderella last month and I originally did write a whole review of it um and I was had one that I was gonna post up on YouTube but due to like I said thesis being insane I just didn't have the time and then recently I was on Tumblr and I saw the comments made by author Melissa Gray about her experience with Cinderella and how she views it and it made me very glad that I hadn't actually uploaded it yet because I think that what she reminded me was that for many people who grew up with Disney and with certain fairy tales we have our own personal frame of reference in how we view them and I think that the personal views that we have of certain characters and their impact on us as people are sometimes held in really weird flux when you when you put them against these really harsh critical lenses and this is not to dismiss her comments or to say or to dismiss criticism it's simply acknowledging that when it comes to fairy tales and feminism there is this very hard path there's a, there's like this weird bridge where you have these women who are feminists who grew up with Disney who grew up with these characters and can see the really empowering elements of them and enjoy these characters and defend them against other feminists who dismiss those those issues and then there are other feminists who are very hypercritical of Disney and fairy tales and the message that they promote for young women and both of those are extremely valid they are both of very equal value to me and I think that as someone who loves Disney, I mean, I love Disney, I love, not Disney the Corporation, but I love Disney movies. I love fairy tales, you know, I'm running my thesis on, on colorism and Snow White. This is something I'm very invested in, but at the same time, as I sat down and I watched Cinderella, I had those thoughts in mind because I didn't grow up liking Cinderella when I was a kid. When I was growing up, I rejected everything girly, you know, as much as a girl named Princess can. I didn't like you know, pink, I didn't like girly stuff. If I watched the show, I liked the tomboy just because she was a tomboy and I was like, you're better, you know? And I, that was me for such a long time because I didn't learn to embrace being a girl until I understood that being a girl didn't mean you had to be weak. And it wasn't as to say that girls are weak, but the societal idea that if you're a girly girl that you're more emotional and you're more prim and all these kind of things that they kind of like push onto more feminine characters, I did not want to be because I was already very sensitive and very thin skinned and I felt like being girly would just you know push me more into that little box of having people think they could like walk all over me and could get away with it because when they would try I would be just very like inside so when I got older and I was able to really process things more I realized that um I had missed some strength in certain characters because they weren't strong in the cliche ways that we sometimes show female strength. You know, like for me, it was like you either had to be Buffy or Xena or, you know, you weren't shit anyway, you know, or, you know, well, you saw you from Sailor Moon. I always like Sailor Moon. So it's like you were, that was as girly as you could be. You could be like Sailor Moon or you could be like Xena. And there really wasn't much in between. And even when I watched Sailor Moon, you know, my favorite was Sailor Mars and Sailor Pluto and Sailor Saturn who were just taking name stuff. I was like, you saw who? Um, but then as I got older, I realized that that didn't have to be the way that you viewed it. And I rewatched Cinderella. And I just remembered watching and thinking like, you were really good at like dealing with all these things. And I, I have learned to really love characters that remind me of Cinderella, like Sansa Stark, you know, um, BBC's Guinevere, Aurora, and Once Upon a Time, I really have learned to admire and enjoy watching characters that show passive strength, who can be good and kind in circumstances that would make anyone else hard and bitter and cold. And for me, as I sat down to watch Cinderella, the, the new version, I had those thoughts in me and I was thinking, you know, yes, this is going to be cliche in a lot of ways, but I, I, I'm, I'm not that kid anymore who sees all of this and thinks that can't be me. You know, I acknowledge and I love characters who are passive and strong. So I wanted to like this new version of Cinderella and I didn't. And it has to do because 
as much as I can admire the strength that is supposed to be there, for me, what I found instead was just kind of like a very dry, a very dull, a very uninspired view of that. There have been so many versions of Cinderella from Ever After to the Raj and Hammerstein Cinderella's, um, which include the, the for television brandy version that came out in 97 and the one showing on Broadway now, which I did see um, about a year or so ago, back when Carly Rae Jemison and Fran Drescher were playing Cinderella and the Evil Queen. And they have all maintained this idea of Cinderella being domestic and having to be stuck in this situation. But they've given her personality. They give her a soul. They give her something more to be than just sad. And that to me is also important because making that strong passive character is more than just having her suffer. It's about letting her be a person. You know, in Ever After, she's a little bit more feisty, but she also has really good female relationships. She has, you know, more relationship with the prince. Um, she saves herself in her own ways, which I, which I enjoy. In the, you know, 97 one, you have multi-cultural casting up the wazoo. You have this amazing blended cast where it's mostly, where it's, most, it's about talent. People got chosen because they were talented, they were best for the roles. Cinderella, um, you know, her emotions are sung by her singing. You get an idea of who she is through song, a lot like in the, the Disney version animated. In the Broadway one, there's a lot of political elements that they put into Cinderella's character, of making her involved with sort of like bring, bridging the gap between the monarchy and the people, which is really interesting considering how she goes from a rags to story. They add that kind of element of her like bringing nuance to the prince of understanding what it's like to be a lay person. So we have all of these really great new iterations that makes this version of Cinderella very unpalpable because there is none of that. I mean, I think the, the most jarring thing for me was that they she becomes Cinderella not as a child but as an adult. As a grown woman, she sort of just kind of like whimsically glides right into being a servant. There is sort of no, you know, oh, she's young, she's pushed into this development as a kid and she grows up in this laborist position, kind of like, um, what's her name from Les Mis? It's more like, no, she just kind of like becomes this person. And I thought it was just really poorly handled. And I think it's, it's more jarring seeing that from a grown live action woman just become a servant in her adulthood than someone who's a child and grows up in obscurity. And it's not to say that you can't be abused when you're older. I'm just saying as a narrative choice, it just did not work for me because I felt like it was infantilizing her because I feel like a lot of her character is infantilized. I mean, she just can't do much of anything. I mean, even in the Disney version of Snow White, she at least talks back in her own passive aggressive ways. This one does little of nothing. And it's, it's infuriating because they can do more. They should do more and they choose not to because they know that they can just make money off of a catchphrase. And they, they have it be said that the reason why she stays at home and does all of these things and allows herself to be treated badly is because her mother told her to have courage and be kind. And her parents love the house that they lived in and she doesn't want to abandon them. And I'm just kind of thinking to myself, but why would your parents want you to be treated like this? Why is being kind and having courage mean that you have to be belittled by choice. I mean, and there's this whole conversation of like, well, she chooses to stay there because she's a good person and she chooses to stay there so she can be better. I'm like, but why does she have to choose to be a servant? Why couldn't they have at least had, like, at least an ever after they were like, you know, it's the middle ages. What's she really going to be if she leaves this house? I mean, because it's kind of like in this fairy tale, ha 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 land, you know, you know, I as an adult who knows history can be like, well, what was she gonna go? Be a prostitute? Be a lady's maid? Be a servant? Like, she didn't have that many options. I can get why she stays here. It's kind of like little ways of trying to be like, well, she's here because she wants to be a good person. It doesn't work. Because the reality would work better if you just push it out there. Just don't say that she's staying there because, oh, this is my family's old home, so I'm here because I... I really think I, I see them in the walls and the paintings and the, it's it's so benign. It's, 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 it was infuriating that this is what they chose to make in 2015. She can still be a good person and have courage and be kind without these kind of like very whispery little 
em phony emotions that they want to phony depth that they want to put into this character that is not there because you didn't write it in there and people are saying like well she's kind of animals I'm like why does it have to, like why does it have to be that because she has good traits that suddenly makes her a fully fledged out person because she's not the the most fleshed out character in the entire film is the prince it's called cinderella and you know and the thing about this movie is that kind of like It upholds all the wrong things. And that's, I think, what's the problem with, like, all the, like, Snow adaptations where they're like, oh, it's not about beauty. It's about being this and being that and being good. No, it's not. Okay? Let's get it straight. Fairy tales are about beauty. These things happen because these people are beautiful. That's the reality. Cinderella gets chosen to be with the prince, not because she has ideas or because she's good, because she's pretty. And they do nothing else to prove that. Like, oh, I spoke to her and her passion. You spoke to her for five seconds and you're like, she's amazing. I want to have deep conversations with her forever. No, and it's not... And it's not the same. And I remember Lily James, who's the actress, she came out and she said about how, like, wearing the corset was, like, torture. She had to go on a liquid diet to fit into it. But it made her feel like a princess. And then when people were criticizing her about it, she's like, why does it matter what my body looks like? Why are they shaming my body type? I think that princesses are good because they tell you how to have noble hearts. I'm kind of like, the best intentions I see of Lily James. But at the same time, I just think to myself that you are a slim, blonde woman in a fairy tale. You are the paragon of, of the idea of beauty. You are not changing anything. You know, like, her having a teeny weeny waist and having her long blonde hair is all about beauty norms. It's not about character, it's not about goodness or courage or nobility or any of those things. Because if those things really mattered, it wouldn't matter what she looked like. It wouldn't matter if she had a tiny waist or a big waist or short hair or long hair or was fat or was skinny. She could be whatever she wanted to be, but she's not because she has to fit this idea and this concept. And that's the problem, is that her, the story of Cinderella is not allowed to evolve in any sort of way. I mean, she still doesn't have any good positive female relationships. Still mostly white. I mean, they give the prince a black best friend and there's some black people in, in the background to make you feel better, but no one of importance is is given in a role that's not white. Um, I said no positive female relationship besides her dead mother and the fairy godmother who gives her shit and then leaves. Then you've got her, Lady Tremaine, who is trying to... First of all, Lady Tremaine is amazing in this movie. Like, her her fashion, her swagger was amazing, and the, the stepsisters were great. But they're given nothing to deal with. They're just one-note, stale characters. Um, there's no depth to the movie. It wants to be there. And it wants so desperately to be trying to tell us something nuanced. But it can't because it wants to be this traditional, idealized fairy tale. And that's the problem, is that like, that's a problem for me with most fairy tale adaptations. I think the reason why I enjoy Maleficent, as much as I think that people hate it because it like bastardized Maleficent, which, you know, there's a point to that, but it did something different, you know? it Positive female relationships, okay? Gave Aurora much more of a personality than she has in the original movie. Gave Maleficent more to do than she did in the original, for better or for worse. It was different. It wasn't anything like the original formula, so there's no reason why it just being a Disney product meant that it couldn't be anything new. Maleficent was a Disney product and it was completely different from the original. It did a lot of bad things, yes, but it also did a lot of really positive things with the script and with what it could do. Cinderella is none of that and I think that's the most disappointing thing because the only thing I was comparing it to in my head, besides the other Cinderella movies, which you can say are fair or not, is Maleficent. And I thought to myself, if Maleficent could make one of the most positive female relationships be between the woman who lays a curse on her and the victim of that curse, and they can make a really nuanced and interesting relationship between those two female characters that's intergenerational, talks about consent, talks about, you know, the, you know, biological families and, and, and non-biological families and all these other really interesting things where it does it well or not if it can at least attempt to do all of that well in a disney product in a disney movie why can't cinderella do that 
why does it still have to be the exact same nonsense and I will admit Maleficent still has a problem of like no diversity as well um we do have the black best friend in Cinderella but like I said that's what he is the black best friend no new ones given there and so while I I do appreciate and I'm not trying to dismiss people as harsh as I may sound about the movie and about the characterization of Cinderella. I'm not trying to say that there's something wrong with people liking Cinderella, the movie. It's quite charming. It's quite beautiful. If you were just watching it because you enjoy Cinderella and you enjoy the film and that connects with you on a personal, emotional level, that's completely valid. And it is not wrong. Like, that's fine. But for me, with someone who doesn't have that attachment, it's much easier for me to look at the critical failures of the movie as a as a text for women as a fairy tale as whatever it tries to be and be like this just doesn't work because it doesn't try to take any chances and I think that and I think to me the problems with Cinderella are are not about the story being inherently bad it's a good story it's a story that connects to a lot of people for a lot of really great reasons but it's just jarring to me that a, that a story that has such a rich history is still treated with the most dry writing possible. I mean, so much has been done with the character since the beginning that I don't, I just don't understand why the movie has to be as dry as it is. And I think that for me, as much as I respect the opinions of others, and I do respect, I do really, like when I read her tweets, I was like, this is really important to, to, to address and that's why I'm going to link to them in the, in the, the notes below because I think that what she says is important about understanding how these fairy tales can be a very can, can be a coping device for people but at the same time for me personally how I feel about it is that as empowering as they can be personally there are larger issues that come up with a lot of these stories that I think that are just kind of how much like, it's for children! They're just fairy tales! But it's so funny to me how that's, that keeps being said when we know that's not true. I mean, there have been study after study after study after study after study showing how these fairy tales and the marketing for them, all these things promote issues with young girls and young boys. So I don't know why, with all of that in mind, we just say, it's for children. <laughs> 